Good evening and welcome to East Point History Series Part 3 from Trailblazers to Transformation, Diversity, Our Strength, and Division, Our Weakness. I am your Mary Dean Holiday Ingram, Mary of Great City of East Point, where there is no point like East Point. And tonight is because I had the awesome opportunity to be here with trailblazers and people who paved the way for all of us in this community to hear in their own words um, what history and what happened um, in, in between the years of the late 1970s to 1992 um, when former Mayor Patsy Oakley became mayor. Uh, but I would absolutely be remiss if we didn't pause for a moment of silence um, on last Friday, a week ago, <laughs> today. Um, one of our former city council members, Marcel Reed, transitioned from labor to rest. And I actually was on a neighborhood association meeting um, called just on that Thursday night um, with the Metal Art Neighborhood Association, and he was in attendance. Um, so hearing that the news on the following day, just a little over, maybe barely 24 hours, that he had transitioned, um, deeply saddened us. And it is a tremendous loss to our city. Um, <coughs> the council, former council member Marcel Reed truly cared about this community um, and served quite valiantly. I, I've noticed a lot of the responses from the community and our sharing and announcing um, this transition and just the, the feedback and the outpouring of um, care and concern and condolences and prayers for the family um, during this difficult time. It, it is often challenging, I mean, it is always challenging when a loved one is lost, but when it is unexpected, um, and I can imagine that the loss is unimaginable. And so I encourage you and continue to ask you to keep um, the family families um, in your thoughts and prayers and pray for peace, strength, and comfort to them during this difficult time. And so we'll start with a moment of silence to honor his life, his legacy, and the service of the city of East Point. Um, our flags are flying and half staff through this entire weekend to honor his life, legacy, and service to the city um, to make sure that the family knows that we're with them. Um, the celebration of life services start on this evening. There's a viewing and the family will be um, accepting visitors from 6.30 to 7.30. And the service will be tomorrow at 11 a.m. And so if we got to just pause for a brief moment of silence, Again, to pray for peace, strength, and comfort for the Reed family during this difficult time. And so, while we're here, um, again, to hear in the words of trailblazers and people who have lived in the city for decades about what it was like to be in the city during the 70s and 80s up to 1992, and just some of the things that they worked on and the impact that they had in serving the community, um, and also giving context really to some of the things that we still have moving forward today in the city. And so tonight I'm here with my co-moderators, former Mayor Patsy Joe Hilliard, um, as well as who was the first African-American and first female mayor of the city of East Point, and former council member and former state, former state representative, um, Joseph Hexall, who was the first black to serve on the East Point City Council in 1982. And um, former Mayor Hillier started service in 1993. So they're our co moderators for this evening. But we also have joining us this evening Miss Betty Pierce, who we will hear in her own words the history of Keep Each One Beautiful. And I'm going to ask you now and see what your response is. And then once she shares, you'll know the true answer. But has that always been the name of the organization as it's operated within the city of East Point? And really that commitment to clean communities, because we know. Clean communities is a form of safety, right? As a form of ensuring safety in our community. If we have a community that looks like no one cares, then oftentimes that's called a broken windows theory. Um, people feel the windows are broken and they can break some more. But in the city of East Point, we absolutely are committed to a clean city and can, we'll, are continuing that work. So we'll be hearing from Ms. Betty Pierce about that, as well as we have Ms. Clara Faith here with us, who 
serve on the plan and zoning commission um, as, a, as a resident in East Point with former Mayor Patrick Bill Hilliard, but she also, she and her husband own Faith Pharmacy um, and had that pharmacy in our city on Washington Road. Um, it's now called Washington Road Pharmacy for over two decades. And so she'll be sharing that perspective with us. And it's just, it's something like a, that we're sitting in their house and we're just having a conversation. So we'll be hearing from Ms. Um, Faith. And then we have Ms. Jane Gunter, who um, was Family Life Ministries and the work that they have done in the community for decades and the impact of community outreach and partnering and working together and how diversity truly became our strength in our city in East Point, um, understanding that division was our weakness. And so through this, this is our uh, third part of this series, the part three of the history series. We started with um, the, the history of African Americans in the city of East, East Point during Black History Month. And then last month, we talked about um, from isolation to transformation, the history of the East Point, um, excuse me, East Washington community. So we focus specifically on that area and heard from some trailblazers and, and, and pioneers about their experiences. And tonight, we are going to hear from these amazing ladies um, in their history and their own words, co-moderated by myself, former Mayor Hilliard, and uh, former Representative Councilman Hexall. And so before we do that, though, as we've done with the other history um, series or other parts of our history series, we will start with video. Um, and this video is going to share with you information um, about this time period that we're covering, some key things that were happening during the history during that time. And then when we come back, we're going to immediately go into our roundtable discussion to be able to have this discussion in here and capture history in the own, uh, own words of our living legend. So sit back and relax, enjoy the video, and then we'll be back shortly to get into a very engaging discussion and hear history in their own words. No, no, no. 
So I hope you enjoyed that video and that capturing of this time period in 2015. And I'm going to turn it over to former Mayor Patrick Hilliard, who is still the neighbor. She and the state here for neighbor. So when I say we're really kind of like sitting at home having this conversation, um, you'll, you'll get that um, feeling from this conversation that we're going to start now with you here. So, Mayor, I'll have you go ahead and, and, and have this picture with you. Okay, this is so exciting to me. And I just want to thank you, Mayor, for what you're doing, for providing this series, because I think that the city will certainly benefit from it because these are the things that they would never hear if you all didn't take your time. I mean, this is what we're going to provide this information for us. So I am happy that my neighbor, Betty Pearson, <laughs> is right next door to me. And I have been in this sport for 40 years. And so Betty, I'll thank you for doing this one. And then the same girl, your house. Oh. Oh. No, speak up. Speak up. Speak up. Speak up. Because 
I probably never would have thought about joining the key police court. But because you were in charge of that and you thought it would be a good place for me to go and meet people, but you didn't know at that time. No, I didn't know that whole thing. But tell us about how you got involved with the key police court here. Well, because it really made a difference. You got the whole community involved. So we had a we had a neighbor named Jack Cook, and Jack was quite character and very strong individual. He's large, large, tall, and, and he, um, he called me and he said he met this lady in Columbus, and he was from Columbus, and he had this lady that was going to work with people there to clean up um, Columbus, and they were starting these systems, trying to get it started nationwide, and they were Chose one school that is the very first one in the lady won it, and she was really a gem and helped us so much. And uh, we went to, uh, he, he said, I he was checking everything out to find out how we could do that. And then we found out that the city of Atlanta was, was going to come on board. And, um, and so that's that's really how we started. We got information about where the first workshops were in Dallas, Texas, and city flew a council. We flew um, myself and Jay and the and the city works department. Uh, his, his name was David, and I can't remember David's right now. But David was was a he, he worked with us in the recycling room because what they asked us to do after we went out to Texas and we had we bad food taxes. And um this this was it. He he did a he did a lot of phone calls and on question and stuff like that, but he was not interested in the and the day we work of the CCS and he he owned the ice company and he had the ice he called the ice company. And what did CCS stand for? Clean Community Systems. CCS, that's who he worked. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Now King American Community was a big national company. Mm -hmm. And uh and and so what we did is we came home with all the information that we had learned from that. Period of time in, in Dallas and uh, tried to get started. I went to Columbus and talked to the lady down there and see what they were doing. They were planting cherry trees. This was the beginning of their 30,000 cherry trees they planted. Mm -hmm. They were you know, the land and festival every year in the office was busy like the year. There are cherry trees down there. One Washington shape. Mm -hmm. It really does. Mm -hmm. That lady was a, she was really a firebox. Uh, she really was. And just, uh, she came up here to East Point to you know, tour the city and help me decide what, where we might start, how we might get started. And the first lady we hired, the city only gave us. Enough money to hire one person. It was in budget. That's all we got. We had to make our money, our other money, any way we could make it, you know, whatever. And, and this was the way that we set up that in the beginning. And uh, uh, the cities were, you know, in the beginning, whether or not we were able to put a lot of money in something like that. They weren't going uh, you know, uh, in charge of the right, and, and they didn't know how far the children were in the office, and we were recommended by this lady in the city of Lyon, Maya Jackson, who thought she would do us a really good job. He was a hater of the litter, like he didn't believe it. He would stop his car. Wild and, and he would get out of the car and pick up some trash on the sidewalk and have the right to do it. 
This is made of text. And so we had all we had all the And um then like I said, we didn't have any money, and we decided that our that we would try on this on this was this kind of thing to go and see if that not done the battery and we didn't really want to. I talked to David and he didn't understand how we the city was not going to pay for a company to come in and do that. And we would have to do it all, and how could we do it? And how could we pick it up? What would we do with it when it was picked up? And so we sat down and worked through all that business and make like a long story short. We started to do something. And what David did was he built a thing on the front end of the grass box. And we had everybody put their papers in a bundle with, with a, you know, a string or what, where they could pick up a bundle of like one time or put in a, a grocery bag that they could pick up and put it in. And all that had been done on one crash day with one crew and one club. And, and, but, but that's what's it going to do for the kids, of course. So they have. They like have a place over on um, where the gym is on the other side of the road. Mm -hmm. The city of the warehouse is something that uh, on, on, off that street. Mm -hmm. and, and that's where they put it to the plate. Mm -hmm. You can see we could collect glass because we had all these in the city. So they were pretty huge help. But what we were going to have to collect if we did not. David was not going to have the last and the brother in the office. Uh, and so we talked about it and we talked to the representatives. We chose a representative from the big companies that were in the city to sit on our little board or send us somebody from that company. And we said, This is a working board that's going to be on the needs of planning funds in the city. Mm -hmm. Right. And that's not a. Not a and so that we just how we did models for a nature of something, they take a little house, not gonna think that it was on house and books, it was a little white house, but two of them was a little bit of one day. And we put the uh, big, big bed in the backyard and said, drop the bottles in the backyard. And Owens Illinois gave us a plan to take the bottles to the over to them. Owens Illinois, they have a big plan that way to find it. We pulled into a bed, they went to the plan, and we went back and wait to find it, and then they paid us to go to the bottle. And then you can go in and sit in the bottles in the harness. It was an interesting place to go. It really was. So that took care of our mom. But you know a lot of money from some of these businesses. They did. They did. And we sold trash cans. And put the company's brain on it. My husband had a trash can on the street in this one. And we let at least one people choose. Where they wanted to be a chance to work. So they wrote them out and looked at the best place in the top. And we put their names. My husband's division was five computers. He was a CBA, they were CBA in North Park, and they had their names on trash cans. And we had those trash cans on, on all cameras. I mean, we saw them on the trash What year was that over there? You know, I. I think it was in the late 70s, like 1981, and he was around for some of those movies. You know, he went to the same movie that we got out of. And that would have been in the late 70s. I'm not sure. I have not found any of the stuff that I bought back in Texas, but it's in my house. Now. I'm going to get it. Now. Well, I think we have to go back to the council. Let all you want to go to Texas. 
so I tried to get it in People were already, you know, they were all changed as well. Somebody that works in the city, or somebody that doesn't work in the city, I'm going to tell them about that. It works too. Right. And even if I want to tell them what to do, what I was asking them to do, they just could not be doing anything. So the president of the East Small Women's Club went to council. And said that every southern courthouse had a hearing in the front yard. But one of them, it didn't have um, New Year, or what was it? Good Year Tire That one had Good Year Tire And so I told her, I said, look, one of them looked at me. They had maybe a fancy camera of sorts on the front yard. But go look, this thing had good year times on it. It probably wasn't even more worship in our days without any food and so those cameras that were busted out. Good year times on it. So I don't know what you use a camera for. But anyway, it took a year for that. And this thing was good. The one that complained to me, complained to counsel. About not wanting that moon to lay in the present. And got it moved because she said, You know, we saw all of us sitting out there about 10 years ago. I bring it by chance. But we did come up to see it. It was a wonderful time in my life. I mean, I don't like what I did. You know. Time goes by and things change. Well, you know, it became quite a comprehensive program because I remember family life ministry. I don't know, I'm trying to figure out how. I remember you used to help with the water project that the ladies had. Um, Francis, you Francis Kennedy. Actually, I talked to Reverend and John to the school trip. That's right. I mean, before about um, in the day at the school, oh, and that's the water project. That was the water project. So that was a part of what they did, and that was after. And that was Francis and the young master, and it was part of our own. Yeah, that's right. And so this, this is a good example of why in history. So TV Point Beautiful was formerly known as and originally known as. Clean community. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah. Keeping their people was a national plan. Right. 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 And they gave us a list of things, that, names that we could use, that we could choose from in clean communities. And just one of them, because it was home. Yeah. And when I had chosen, it was had chosen. So we wanted to have something different for us because. It was a city thing. Mm -hmm. You know, it was a city thing. Yeah. And we were next to it. I think we had the same kind of people who were better than we were as far out as they were. I don't know how to talk. But I don't like to talk anymore. Yeah. I'm good. Yeah. 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 Let me tell you, Dave Cooper got that Taylor Time mm -hmm. given to the city. You know, he, he got, I said he didn't want to work. Where is Santa Claus? I thought they were just yeah, yeah, the waterhouse. Yeah, and then when the end was the waterhouse, and then the three of landscaping, it was an ugly piece of red mud that uh, the, uh, that was used for um, political time. You know, I bet there were how many out there know? You know, so it's a can I transition to something? That you were talking about. One of the things that the community, I think, had something to do with they didn't want political sound because it flooded the city at that time. And in fact, East Point's history was that they didn't allow signs in East Point real estate sign at that time, which to me was a, a form of discrimination or encouraging certain people not to move to the city. And of course, the community at that time, if I remember correctly, correctly if I'm wrong, I think the community supported. That dark, dark red at that time to make sure we have all the sides put in the middle. And that was another thing we talked about, clean community. Ruth, I remember the speaker asked you, and I think 
you got to uh, bet it, sorry, you straighten me out. I was asking how many African Americans were on it at that time. You remember the conversation you and I had about that? About how many blacks were involved at that time? Oh, you were to put somebody on the board, and the board was a working board. It was not a board that you just put somebody on. Well, and 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 and, 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 and Ernest James also was a member of the board, and he was the, he was the one that called the players, but as in John. Yeah, but I don't know what that was. The board was they did a lot of work, but I also say we have to remember that. Because those positive things were happening for the majority of people in the city at that time, a number of people were still left out. And that's one of the things that I've always had a question about. Uh, how can we go forward now? Remember that because this meeting was designed to move some of the things that were way back uh, TCF, but also some things that we probably uh, need to remind ourselves that we don't have to do. Yes, yeah, we can absolutely let our history inform. I mean, that's the way you. Has smart growth, right? You gotta know where you've been, you know where you're going. Mm -hmm. And we talk about the way the commission, Ms. Claire, they you on the same as on the commission, and that's how you met with the former Mary Hillary. Yeah. And, and you mentioned something earlier about the purple sign. We don't we, we, no, have no purple house. Kind of share like <laughs> that, what that experience was then. Yeah. 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 No, we, we got, she and I drove around. Some of the buildings they call them, and we expected the land to be building there, but it sure was up the coast. I don't really know that now, not really. <laughs> 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 Good an inspection, right? Uh, you know, you know, hang out is all closed, you know, white, or, or green, or it's okay, pastel, or whatever, you know, still together. But now, I'm shocked, I mean, we're not beach, <laughs> yeah, I really look at it here from my end of the South Florida We have a lot of color. We have an individual um, development practice that does do some significant work around, you know, trying to build it um, consistent with the, yeah. the community. But what was your experience like on like on setting the zone commission? And, you know, when did you decide, how did you end up with this guy to open? Well, we had a story that we had a
Yeah. So did you guys have like a, a checklist that you were riding around? So it was a part of the Planning and Zoning Commission. The Planning and Zoning Commission members would ride around and look at Anyone else besides us? We did, we did, we were serious about it. We yeah. paid nine years off. So. Yeah. We yeah. have a paycheck to do it. They volunteered. Exactly. So that's what they did. Volunteered. Yeah. Yeah. And I served the uh, I was working clothes and he's one for 25 years. He gave that up two years ago, thank goodness. And uh, so it was uh, I, Sunday school. Day. So 
it was a big space. It's a population of wonderful people. We had what we had, not wonderful, wonderful relationships. And uh, we, we did 572 families from Katrina. And our judge here, Judge Oliver, she came over to my um, Everybody pitched in and did what they could. When the families came, the girls took babies up into the nursery and they took care of the babies. And next thing you knew, mothers would come to get the girls and they would head to camp and buy clothes for the babies. It was awesome. Mm -hmm. it was took care of a lot of people. It was impactful. It was awesome. Mm -hmm. And <laughs> And after that, um, we were there about 20 years or more, uh, maybe 25 or 30. <laughs> but one day the church was closing, and I started driving around and I said, Okay, God, this is your business. This is not my business. If you can find us a place, well, the secretary of the Baptist church called the secretary of the Baptist church. Church in April, Jamie Philly. I was invited over. We, we walked in. They gave us a room. We were mm -hmm. great to make that. And we've been there ever since. And it's a wonderful, wonderful connection. But while I was here, wow, the work here. And I told Patsy one day, I said, when they come into your office, just don't ask them any questions. <laughs> don't interview them. Just send them to me and I'll do it. So that's what she, that was her hobby, to make sure she didn't have to do it. I remember that when I went to your office, because she said, come here, come and let me show you our, my operation. Okay. And so she had this big filing cabinet, and you had pictures of everybody who she had ever served. And so she could pull out and say, oh yeah, I remember him. And she knew all about him. Remember, and then you knew where yeah. But we allow the only people that would see those files would be the police department. If they needed to investigate something, they were allowed to come and see it. Mm -hmm. Files are very, very important. Well, it was a great piece, you know, for yeah. the community because I remember the house, remember when you gave rent to a lady, she was she had to move out of her house, she had a children stand there. But she and she wanted she didn't have money to pay to go to public housing. She had to, you had to pay you had to pay the first payment, I guess. And you I called her and said, What should we do? Because she they're, they're saying she has to move from her residence and she has no place to go. And she has children who she wants to go with her. But they were grown children, but they were not allowed to go in that public housing. So anyway. You said, well, send her over. Jane gave her her rent for that month. And then the lady came, of course, but she, it just happened at the time that she didn't have her check. But I mean, those were the kinds of services that you know, they provided. I know we said the children could not move there with her, but she was able to go. And then I think that made them think, well, I guess we really have to get a job and take care of ourselves because mom had been paying for us all this time, and they just thought that she was responsible to take care of the grown, grown children, so. And, and I think that speaks to the importance of uh, that houses of faith and places of worship have played in our community. So you're sharing, like, the story and the journey of family life ministries and the impact that it's had and continues to have as we you know, experience the unprecedented time of uncertainty by brought on by COVID nineteen pandemic. The for the immediate place that we went was the place of the worship, right? So the but pandemic. Now, the church is alone. They're not open today. Well, they're starting to open up with with now with the vaccination. But in that moment, that immediate response. Of, so things closed down. I believe it was like March sixteenth. We're like like. I, I hadn't been back into my office or my full time job since like March 13th. Right. That was our first day, all right? Okay. Over a year ago. And that first week in April, we got a call from Food Containing Schools that were their spring break. They needed help with distri distributing food um, to their families. And I remember 
former council member Ann Douglas and her passion and commitment to the food bank at East Point First Mountain Church. And I said, let me call them because I'm sure there's a system already in place. And from that week, every week since to now, we provide a partner with local houses of faith to provide food to families um, during this pan pandemic. And we've distributed over 5.5 million pounds of food. Um, We're getting the food boxes from the food bank. The food boxes from the food bank, because the Atlanta Community Food Bank is here in the city of East Point. And it's just been a huge help. But you may, it made me think about how places of worship and faith houses have come, come really continued to right. bridge those gaps right. forever, bridging the gaps in the community and really making sure that it's more than just a, a service, right? It's the service you do beyond those for a while. So, so thank you for that. But how did you meet the iconic lady in the video and about the, the, the business or the meetings that you would show up with, with Mary Hillier at the time? Um, she you have she had you come along. What what was those six weeks? Well, she's been with me. Uh, <laughs> actually, as a young girl, I'm from Atlanta, I went to Maxwell Air Force Base, and uh, then I later was great child and uh, old term. You might want to tell where Maxwell at Air Force Base is. Maxwell in Montgomery, Alabama. Right. Okay. 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 That does tell a lot. But anyway, the, my doctor was a woman and she was tough as nails and she said, you better do a lot of walking because you're not getting anything playing around here. So I did a lot of walking and one day I was walking in the city and I always have corn in my shoe and I could ride, not that we had any coins, but if I needed to ride the bus, I could have. But I never did until that day. Mm -hmm. And I have to be on the bus when he goes to his wow. So what I do today is I go to schools and I tell that story and I tell them about the being bullied. And that's it one to do once and he brought what was her name from the Stephen stage. Uh, one of your one of your sorority sisters. <laughs> anyway, when I said to the, the girls, um, you know, you know, this is and This is what happened. You ever know, been bored? And this beautiful young girl with a caramel colored skin said, and I told her, and I said, I mean, why? And she said, why do you say that? And she said, because I'm not proud. Mm. It's my skin color. I didn't know that that was an issue. Or the new year's that day, it was sad. But having breathtaking girls, she's rejected. Mm -hmm. And I said, I was working with Pastor Roosevelt Henry at the Presbyterian Church. Could have been more chocolate, but I'm Pastor Roosevelt. And when we have pictures together, it's like black and white for sure. He told me he had never been bullied. <laughs> <laughs> About the yeah. So, so, so that is some a piece of information that I absolutely did not know. But as we are learning history, right, and as our kids are learning history, I mean, Rosa Parks is an iconic history figure, not just because she's Rosa, but because of her involvement in the civil rights movement, right, and her side of the business. But to know that someone now who has such a connection to East Point was actually on the bus the day that she was arrested. But actually, after that, I do travel with the Rosa Parks Caribbean and even in Rome, you know, stories to tell each other the story. And uh, this last year, I was invited to the Washington to the Library of Congress, mm -hmm. and it came my way, <laughs> like she had to write And Posted that you would come and be celebrated in the room that they opened up, bigger than this room, with all of the memorabilia, mm -hmm. things that she had written on scratches of flower sacks and you know paper bags and mm -hmm. uh, rent receipts. You know she wrote things, and so all that's in that museum. It's like a museum of frozen parts. 
And that day I had about 18 different TV channels come up to me and interview me. And one of them, and you don't know which one he wants plays, he started with a political verbiage. And I said, you may be dismissed. <laughs> <laughs> and so they took him, you know, he, he backed up whatever. But her book is out, and mm -hmm. that's the reason we took that day for me and my stories. And we wow. it's because when they were going through the archives and putting it all together, that I got a phone call one day that from Susan Brayden at the Library of Congress, and she said, Who are you? And I said, <laughs> Um, anyway, I said, I'm Jane Denner, and she said, I know, but who are you as far as Ms. Parks is concerned? Because I know in front of stuff, and it's just, there's 12 pictures that I've been found with her. And I said, well, I was from the hospital that she was arrested. Well, then I became part of the story. Mm -hmm. So that book is out. It's awesome. You know, I think that this, this it, it tells a different story mm -hmm. because when this happened to Jane, she had no idea the situation she would have been on that bus. Oh. And it, you know, it, it came to me when I was with you at the school when these young girls were asking you to explain. How you happened to be there, what you did. Remember, they said, What did you do? Because they kept saying, well, you know, just tell me this again. Now, you were on the bus, and then so when you got off the bus, where did you go? Or where did she go? You know, they just kept asking. I was thinking, Well, they would want, they would want to know. And see, but Jane didn't know she's on this Air Force base, not allowed really to go walk in, in the town after that. You know, you know yeah. and no, yeah. you see, and what these girls are saying, but we can't understand why they know because people, the, you know, the the, the, bus the water, the you know, when they were shooting, when they the water was going through all of that. Where were we? it was all on TV, you know, so you didn't know, but she didn't know. In, in the uh, face, and so then we're talking about how things were at that time, you know. So that gets back to how, how it was right. that they were, and she was white, and so they were protected, you know. They didn't, they didn't, she had no idea. So, some had experience, and now hearing the things that people are saying, and what, what her family and what her organization has shared with you, it gives you even a better appreciation for the situation that we have experienced. Right. People, you know, who are not white have experienced, which is really valuable because, and I guess that what, is what makes you such a great person. And so I didn't know you, I didn't know I was white when I grew up in mm -hmm. I lived in a Jewish black white neighborhood who played together. My mother was not prejudiced. There was no like the Pentecostal daughter across the street from me was as well in my house as the Jewish one in the middle of the block, or the Catholic Episcopalian, or anyone. We were allowed to go to everybody's church. I had no idea that there was a difference in the religion of memory, and I'm telling you. So, so, so I, I think, um, Mayor, like this conversation makes me really think about how history is hidden, right? So there are a lot of facts, not fiction, not myths, of in America's history that relates to people of color. Um, or, you know, and that could be by hot um, black Indian and people of color, right? Like this comprehensive definition of people of color that has been kept from us. And I include, like, so you, me, like me, white people, black people, like just all Americans. Um, one that comes to mind from that was just celebrated, um, well, the 100 years um, from the, the Tulsa race massacre, mm -hmm. right? Black Wall Street. And how that is not, I mean, growing up, I didn't learn that in social studies, right? I didn't learn that in history. It was never taught 
but it's a fact, right? So it's not that, and what, what we try to do when we have this bridge and the race gap, a most, um, most cultural shared understanding of history in America and our path forward. Because the reality of it is, is, it's just facts, right? And I think it has to inform how we move and why things exist in our community as they exist and kind of give us this level of enlightenment, right? But I also share with people, because in that space, when we had that, we had like a fishbowl, it was really a, a really good experience. But I also caution people to not make the assumption that just because people are Black that we know all of our history, and just because people are white that they don't know our history. Like, don't make any assumptions because we're all Americans. And there's information and facts that have been kept from us and that we can learn from each other. And so I think this is a great segue in talking about um, Ms. Parks and the Civil Rights Movement and just how that is really kind of the motivation behind this history series, right? What are some facts in the history of East Point that people don't know that we can share and uncover, right, so that we have a more enlightened history, a comprehensive and inclusive history, but also help us move forward with that knowledge and build on understanding that strength or those truths that might not all be so great and, and, and things that we like, but they happen. And we can't change that. And there is value, there is strength, there is power, there is a real collective energy that comes from all of us knowing that. So I, I want to kind of transition in that. And since I saw your hand, you know, maybe we can talk. Um, this Pierce, you've been in the city for 56 years, which means you were here um, at a time. I'm trying to do my math really quickly. But on July 15, 1912, probably that was too long ago. That's over 100 years. But on that day, the East Point City Council unanimously decided that Black people had to live in a certain area of town, which was 45 acres, immediately adjacent to three fertilizer plants, an oil plant, and a chemical plant. It was so steep, they called it steep town. And imagine the level of environmental injustice and like just contaminate of being in that space. And the selfish reasons were we wanted the, they wanted the workers to be closer to work so they wouldn't be late and so that they could keep an eye on them. But to have people live in in those types of conditions and that level of having people live immediately to industrial use kind of you know, spread throughout the city because we have those different places. But thinking about that and that history, right? The first blacks who came to East Point were slaves on the colony plantation and come before the first settlers. And so the history of East Point is inextricably tied to black people, right? We kind of came together. And people of color, other people of color have come. But during the time, if, if Pat Mayor, a former council member and former state rep, Textile, was the first black on council in 1982, which means not only was I born, I was born in 74. I was five years old at that point. So that's my math is off. 74 to 82, that's eight years old, right? But no, but I'm just saying, I was here. I was, you know, usually when you hear about history, civil rights movement, it's before people were born. Like the people were, it's like, oh, well, that didn't happen during my lifetime. You were the first, while I'm a little child, and Mary Gilliam, when you became the first black mayor and the first female mayor of the city, I had just graduated high school. I graduated high school in 92, right? And so the perspective that shares with me is, what was it like for so long in this city, right? Um, you, Ms. Pierce, she said, you realize that the former mayor here was educated. That was different. And that was strength, right? That was something that could be used of value in the city. But, and it made you look past skin color, right? To see the value of a human being, the human value. We all have equal value. But I'm sure everybody wasn't like that at that time, right? Ms. Clara Faith, Ms. Nancy, you guys were here when we were transitioning from this, the, this division of black and white, from black and white to... People were moving because we're black people. The only facts now the husband worked at Delta Airlines in And I asked my husband that he thought we were going to lose 
money around houses and the neighborhood was changed. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and we were going to move and it said no we were not going to move and you were like you got concerned about losing any money mm -hmm. but they moved and guess where they moved where but they moved to Winnet County in a, in a big development that was high and it's not so high mm -hmm. so, so things changed things changed that they, they ran and things changed mm -hmm. And, and, and people kept saying, sit still, the world's not in it. Right. <laughs> you know, it's not. Well, you got to remember when I was on city council, one of the mantras that people used to have was the last person leaves East Point, turn out the lights. When I've heard that before, right. turn out the lights. Because they were so afraid that East Point was going to be doomed to darkness for forever. I mean, not literally darkness, excuse me, yeah. darkness in terms of perception. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that is still the biggest movement, yeah, I think, today among white people. 
is that they were, their race will be destroyed once they mix with black people. Yeah, to, to manifest, we have no fear. I, I live with no fear too. I leave with no fear. And that's why we're having this courageous conversation, right? Because the reality of it is, this is the first time in my lifetime, I'm only 47, but this is the first time in my lifetime when non-Black people have said publicly that racism is wrong. And I'm not saying you guys sitting here at the table, but where there is a, a worldwide outcry when George Floyd was murdered under the knee of a police officer, that I feel awakened the soul of America, right? And that and that was kind of the line in the sand where people were like, well, you know, I was, I was, if other people in my family were like that, but I'm not like that, and we're gonna speak out. And everybody came together, a multicultural outcry saying, look, this has to stop. Racism in America is not okay. We have to dismantle systemic racism and we have to move forward. The reality though is. We live in a country where racism and the institutional and structural racism has been normalized. And so we are now trying to have conversations as a multicultural community around, okay, so what are the things that I learned? I, I don't believe those things. How do we move forward? So this whole idea of bridging the race gap, a multicultural shared understanding of racism in America, because it exists, and our path forward. How do we as a, a very multicultural, diverse community move forward? And for me, being here in the city of East Point, it's like, what is the history of East Point? What is the history of race relations in East Point? Because now I live in a city where we are extremely welcoming, inclusive, you know, very um, connected, everyone is valued. That's what we pride ourselves on, but it's not always been like that, right? Um, when Ms. Pierce was talking about the time of the transition or the white flight as this term, this city went from having all white males serve as council members and mayor. Mary Hilliers was the 30th mayor. So the first 29 mayors of the city were white men, right? And the, the whole council makeup kind of was like that. Now we went from that to now we have a council made up of mayor and eight council members and eight members on the council are black and one is white. And so it's kind of like moving from both extremes, right? But the community itself, because there's a very real level of intentionality around valuing everyone, respecting everyone, embracing our different learning from everyone, you know, about different cultural differences to be able to continue to move forward but there are things that are important in our history that we must know and can't be hidden in the city of East Point to be able to help people understand that yes this is how it is now it's not always been like that so we have to work collectively together to keep it and I appreciate you guys sharing those perspectives right or being you know keep community um keep clean community systems but also the building in the home and in, in next door, how that was happening and how the white flight started happening and what your neighbor said. Miss Miss Clara Faith working at the polls for 25 years, which means you've seen the level of voter suppression and, and things that we're now seeing again. Well, tell me, when I first moved to East Point in 1971, but I don't know if you remember they had a poll in place over by Stan Road. The first time I went to vote, coming from New York City, because I was a consistent voter. I went to vote. They had me there for six hours. Mm -hmm. They wouldn't allow me to vote. And they were saying, well, we need to check downtown. We need to check interior. They made me sit on the side. Everybody was coming and voting. There was very few blacks voting at that time because I lived on Staten Road. And I remember that. See, my experiences are different from, from what you had. And I'm very in New York City, for example. Mm -hmm. I remember very vividly when I, when I, the reason I have better taste for some certain police officers. I was seven years old. And a police officer said, come here, boy, come here. And I went, well, I'll get some, get some. Because the police officer said, be six feet tall at that time. And they were Irish, and most of them were Irish, and they were white. He come here, little boy, come here, little boy. Yes, sir. I said, yes, sir. Said, come here, talk to my partner. Shake your head in. Shake your head in. I said, yes, sir. I looked over there. The officer grabbed me, pulled me over in a press. Oh, yeah. Smacked me on the side of the face, threw me back on the street, and drove down the street laughing. I had that kind of encounter. Mm -hmm. So a lot of bitterness, a lot of bitterness that I came to Atlanta with. 
I'd have been the same. My experiences were different. So part of the transition that I saw my job when I got on council was not to compromise, to demand that black people get justice and they were inclusive. And I remember you confronted me one time, Ruth, and I love you for I've been, and I love you for it. You told me, Joe, why do you always push things for black people? You don't do anything for white people. You remember that conversation? In, in white people? You told me I was helping put your food in the, in the car? You told me that I was always pushing things for black people. Well, I think at that time, because of the transition, that's what I had to do. Because they were not there at that time. And I turned off a lot of people about it. But a lot of people got very angry. But that was what I had. Everything in the hospital. We had me back to the hospital board. Pat was the first one in, uh, uh, that I appointed to the development department. There were no blacks in the development department. You two got to know each other as a result of that. So we can stay here all day talking about some things that were wrong. It's not Joe Hextall's experience, but all of you had experiences too that were different from me. But I thank God that we are where we are now. At least we're trying to sit down civilly and talk about things the way they were. Yeah. And yeah. what the possibilities could be going forward. So if I sound like I'm bitter, I'm saying to the TV audience and to others, forgive me, because I'm very, very bitter. And I, my wife tells me, you need to get over it. You need to get over it. But it's very difficult to deal with some experiences that you have as a black man dealing with white America, coming from the North, going down South, watching you see I had to get over color, color car to go down South. See, these are kind of, these are real experiences you have. I mean, a lot of young people like this, they don't know that. So for the three of you to be here, I, I respect you. We call other people, they were afraid to come because they didn't want to be confronted with the truth. I admire the three of you not being afraid to come here and tell the truth and not be afraid to listen to other people's opinions that might be different than yours and might be somewhat hostile. So and, I appreciate the love. And adding to the history of our, yeah. of our city. I remember when I was five years old, I was going to and I was asking my daddy on Saturday, I just remember we, we were in Kessler's department. There was a man, this man store and a department store. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and it was in the back hall, they had two uh, boy families. I was first. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And one said whites and one said colors. It didn't say colors. I remember that. From and I asked that, why? And he why? And I didn't really know what the colors were. Really? You know, because I was lucky to this little kid. And you know, he couldn't. What he told me, I couldn't understand. And I don't think he knew what to tell me. Yeah. 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 And, and that he is. He didn't know what to tell me. Yeah. He didn't know what to tell you. It was yeah. rare. And I asked. And I didn't understand what he said to this day. It wasn't what I thought about that. Mm -hmm. yeah. And there were two people. Yeah. Over my lifetime. Because, and, and really, he couldn't, he just couldn't tell me why. Yeah. And, and it's. It's because it's yeah, possible. Sometimes someone in the and he yeah. had his, his problems with yeah. the kids at school because my grandmother couldn't read or write English or read. She yeah. was really illiterate. And she made him wear these black stockings, and none of the kids did. He would take them off and put them on the bridge before he got to the school, and then he would put them back so he could put them back on the grandma. So that's how he grew up, and he probably, I don't know what he thought. See, I don't, you yeah. don't know what I see. I see. Right. Right. And it's hard to have that conversation. Right, it's so one thing you gotta remember whether it was Greek, whether it was Jews, whether it was Irish, whether it was Italian, one thing that those uh, nationalities can do, they can assimilate. Okay. If their name was Bernstein, you can change it to Burns. Right. If their name was Polaski, right. you can change it to Pola. Yeah. You know, you can do all those kind of things. If your name was, was Bornstein, you know, you take change the pull up. But the one thing the Arabs, the Chinese, the Jews, the Greeks could do, they could assimilate in the culture and be white. The thing that we still see today, that black people cannot assimilate in the culture, because we can't we change our name, we can change our culture, but you can't change that skin color. And that's the same with Hispanics, because mm -hmm. no matter, and see, I knew people as Gomez and Martinez, and see now it's Gomez. Martin, you never know. Mm -hmm. but that's how it's, but I, this, you know, I think I was happy that Joe mentioned his experience with the police department because people 
me to know why. I, I'm always after him because he's always fussing on the police. But until he told me the story about him, relate to it. But then I was mad. I was so shocked when the, the, the church, you know, this is part of the change that many of the people who attended some of these churches moved to different communities. So the churches were still at East Point. And so then they were selling them. And so a lot of the black ministers were coming in, buying the church. And you knew it was so, sort of the Lord church. Were they going to ask Yeah, Jefferson Avenue. I'll, just, I'll never forget this. I couldn't understand what the controversy was. And they, they, this church had come and they bought, they were buying the church. And uh, people came to me and said, you know, it's just terrible. They have these young children in there at 11 and 12 o'clock at night, and the long services. And uh, it's disturbing. I'm thinking, well, you know, I, don't know I, I was just shocked that they were upset about it because these were different people. See, what happened when the churches were first built, people walked to church. You know, they walked to church. They were, the churches were not. Required to have parking lots all like we do now. So they don't, so they, they were not used to these people coming and parking. And so we had a really big problem because they were complaining about people parking in front of their houses. <laughs> and one night, one person, this is not how I was ever forget his name, but his daughter came and they walked in a person who was a church. And so then they, of course, called the police, called the all went over there. And he was refusing to move the car. They weren't going to let this let him out. I mean, you know, things like that. So we made arrangements with the school district, the Tri Cities, to let people park there and then walk down to the church. Well, then I got complaints about strange people in the neighborhood. <laughs> <laughs> I said, well, how are they supposed to get there? You know, so these were these are just things mm -hmm. that I, I told them when they were seeing the church was still there. It's the it was. progress of that church is that, that their daughter is a famous opera singer. Mm -hmm. And they bought the East Point Presbyterian Church one. Mm -hmm. So, and they have parking. I'll tell you a little story from the back of the to the um, Roman family, the, you know, the, uh, there in this day, I was having to get up my house with his son and his beautiful wife, and, and God love him. I, I gave him something, and I didn't know he had a bad heart. And, and it, it was a yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. cheese on it. And, and I had my brother said, yeah. This was not something you should <laughs> eat. <laughs> you know, but God loved me. It was the sweetest, kindest thing. And he took Claire and I on a little visit down to, to a spa they bought. We stayed with them a week. Yeah. And they let, we sold the church. They allowed us to stay in the church. We had only two families. It was a huge church. In the beginning, we had 2,000 people bring rent away. Okay, so we did the families and we moved in and we paid the bills. And so they allowed us to stay. We, were, we still had on Wednesday night service, they had a twin, uh, first, first night service. We met at 11 o'clock, they met at 12 o'clock for, for, for their service. Children were running in the church again for the first time. It was wonderful. We had no children. We had 55 old ladies in their 80s. <laughs> <laughs> we didn't have any children running around. It was so nice to get kids in the church again. And we worshiped with them for six years. Okay. And got really upset when a member of uh, the Baptist table, I've forgotten what it was called now. And actually, the elephant had been in our church. And he too had moved. And, and he wrote this article about us having this thing. It was all written on, um, not coming from a really good point because it, he, he explained it all in the way it really didn't happen. You know what I mean? It was all good. There was no anybody. Doing it, right? Yeah, and, and he had all these reasons, you know. I mean, it, it just 
you just like when this is tied up in the space but but I think what you were highlighting and I could stay here all night and day with you because this is so rich um but we're gonna wrap up but what I think what you are bringing up and what you brought up the story about your father when you asked him why what is it yeah. like what's, so you have people who try to rewrite history and frame it in a light most favorable, favorable to them. <laughs> right? It's like you rewrite history in a light most favorable to them. So you, you don't talk about the atrocities and the rapes and the murder of religion and all of that of people of color in the country. Because that doesn't, that I mean, you know, that's not all white people. We're not saying it's all white people. It is the people who did it in the past and that informs the systemic and institutional racism in this country. But for your father, when you ask him that question, I have a daughter who's 11, and we are intentional about teaching her about one, her strength and her value as a, a young lady of color and her hair and her expression and all that, but also about history. And so why that that conversation for your father for, to tell his five-year-old daughter at the time, because that colored water fountain symbolized so much um murder and kill, like just so many painful atrocities he didn't know how to share it with him that moment right um and i think with this awakening of the world when you see a black man murdered under the knee of a white officer i think now is the time to have those conversations like now is the time to say it's okay not to know regardless of your age right regardless of your race and your ethnicity Let's just have a conversation so that we can get this multicultural shared understanding. And I'm going to end have, um, Rep. Pesach end us with um, the MLK holiday that was shown in the video. Because, you know, Martin Luther King Jr. died at a very early age, but he changed the world, right? In his I Have a Dream that one day my kids will be judged by the content of their character and not the color of their skin, right? And I think that's what makes these points so unique is because the overall majority of our residents feel the same way, right? This is a place where everyone is welcome and valued. And so this has been rich. I am full, I've, talked, I've taken notes as we've been talking. Um, thank you, Ms. Betty Pierce. Thank you, Ms. Claire Faith. Thank you, Ms. Jane Gunter, for your service, first of all, because in all of your stories, there was a service. There was volunteer service and, and, and um, engagement and working hard to uplift this community, to clean the community, to make sure there was some level of consistency and how to, to feed the community, right? So thank you all so much for that and, and coming to share history in your own words. And so former rep councilman, I can always forget what I want to call you, former rep councilman, um, councilman rep textile, share with us why we but important for East Point to lead the way because we continue to lead the way. That's why I say there's no point like East Point. We're a model city for the echo of the just, inclusive, fair, vibrant, thriving community where everyone is valued and part of our growth. I also say it because um, I want to check to say why she said to check us out to see. But talk about how we led the way with the ML Martin Luther King through a holiday in the city of East Point. And then close us out with any final words you have. And, and Mary, after you said the words, I promise I won't say anything else other than again, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, a question. I just have a question. And maybe Joe can answer this. Why do people not emulate what Martin Luther King put out there orally, physically, non-violence? Yeah. Nobody is following. Well, I think that um, you know, coming from the Kawan, I think it's five five. That says an eye for an eye, two for two, an eye for an eye, an eye for an ear. Uh, everybody has different velocities, like, and I hate to say it on film, because it might just cause me problems in the future. I'm afraid say it. it doesn't. Don't say it. But I didn't grow up in a community to turn out the cheek. My mentor in New York City happened to be Malcolm X and Louis Fargo. And I knew very little about that. In fact, I went to March of Washington because I was a community leader. They took me down to March of Washington. But that philosophy turned another cheek. I just never bought it today. But I think the reason is, is that people don't share the most important binding factor in this universe is love. Because they're afraid. I'm afraid of 
being rejected by white folks. And white folks are afraid of being in a position of less than master over, over, the, uh, over, over the slave. And they're afraid of losing that position. And I'm afraid of being threatened in that position. So, Jim, have I rejected you? No, you've been loving and helpful and, and gracious. So yes. And I, and I think the kind of that, that the reason why I'm not the problem said it and people watching like the generalities of whites, right? And so you're using that figurative and not literally. So let me just interject that, right? Mm -hmm. So we said uh, white folks um want to be this way and black people. Oh, so it's not all right. Oh. Yes, so I'm you know to your point of, of course. The what first one that said one of the first whites that said to I'm gonna I'm gonna vote for you. Was this young lady sitting right here? It's Clarence. Clarence, I'm going to vote you. But if you remember, this is back in 19. I think the first time I ran was was against uh, Percy Franklin, and I think she was one of the first ones to say I vote you. When and, and you, right. you mentioned that right. you you followed Minister um, Malcolm X, but you were instrumental <coughs> in making sure that East Point led the way and having. M. O. King Day holiday, so holiday in the city of East Point. So, so share with, share that. Share that. The first city that the holiday was passed in 1983 as a national holiday, but a lot of people didn't observe it. Before it was a state holiday. Before even the cities had it, um, I was in a position because of the demand for my vote to demand something from the council, and one of the things I was able to negotiate. Because of the vote, as they say, quick quick pro quo was to get a Martin Luther King holiday at this point. And I was very, very proud of that. We have been, and, and uh, many can remember, a lot of people on council didn't like each other. <laughs> they hated each other. They hated each other. The dear old black Joe sat back and I would watch them. I would watch that hate. And as a result of that hate and that dislike, I was able to put myself in a humble position and get on the right team. You know, I'm a key holiday. Later in the day, my husband grew up in Calvary's Farm. I don't know if anybody's ever told you the difference between the two towns. College Park was their uh, educationally uh, wrong in the way it was. It had Cox College that used to be in the end that moved to College Park and the Academy. And, and, and a little of a private citizen's GMI was military. Okay, my husband lived in Hot Farm. He was at a basketball game in my group of girls. They had a meal and wine every night. And my husband was a song person, he was at the coach, picked him up by the back of his car, and just picked him up and picked him out of the way. He was about the war power, about the Greek heritage, about religion, 
about having faith, 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 faith drugs, how you sold it to an African family. There's a number of things that I think just need to come out because of history. Yeah, Dr. Dr. A, right? Now, over the years, those are obviously. Yeah, those are And we could tell you a lot about that. Yeah, the swimming pool. The swimming pool. The swimming pool before they the kept the talk in front of me. They said they're going to close the swimming pool because the black boys were chasing the white girls. That's why the swimming pool was closed. And, and so, I, look, we will be here. Look, 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 Forward, um, but you're right. So, so this is this is to ensure that there's a comprehensive, and inclusive history of East Point, and that facts that may not have been shared are shared in people's own words to inform the work that we do moving forward. Because it's it's, 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 it's um, extremely important that we move move forward exactly. in a level of the past. Now we gotta think about Absolutely, absolutely, and so um, I. Look, we could we could be here literally. I, I truly enjoy learning history, um, but not re not just reading it, but hearing because of the the context and the the um the way you shared and what you share and the just it brings it to life. And so I I want to say a million and one trillion thousand. I don't know whatever word that's not out there in numbers. Thank you um, for being a part of. Um, helping us have a more comprehensive, inclusive history of the city of East Point, sharing your experiences in your own words, sharing the facts because we can't change the facts. They are what they are, but it is absolutely to inform us as we move forward and continue to um, ensure that East Point is a vibrant, thriving, clean, safe community for everyone. Especially the people. A lot of times, people get so focused on attracting new, right? Attracting economic development that brings new people, and there's a place for that. But it's extremely important that we honor, um, respect all humanity, and ensure that we are growing in a way that allows everyone, the, our legacy residents and legacy businesses, to stay with us as we grow and experience this growth. So, thank you all so very much for this time tonight. I hope that each of you enjoyed it as much as I have. And for those who will watch it, this will be um, remain online and on YouTube and accessible to people. So we will have a space where you'll see part one, two, three, and we'll continue to build on um, with, it, with this very real intentional focus of moving forward, um, understanding, our, having a multicultural shared understanding of racism in America, our path forward, and how we as a city embraced diversity as our strength and understood that division was our weakness. So thank you all so very much. Thank you for everyone who's tuned in. And we will be back. This is an ongoing history series. And as you can tell, every time we get together, we think of other things that we need to dive a little deeper into to share. And so we'll continue to do this. Um, I, I feel it's extremely important um, that we as a community and as the city um, actually leads the way in this initiative to bring our history to bear so that it informs our future. Can't know where you want to know where you've been and, and the value and the strength and all of the lessons, the triumphs and the challenges and the struggles. So thank you so much. Have a great weekend. Happy Father's Day um, to all of the fathers. I know this will be a little dated if you watch it after Father's Day, but it is Father's Day weekend. Um, so let's celebrate our fathers. There's a lot of stuff that happens around Mother's Day, but I'm going to make sure that I am um, extremely um, nice to my husband this week. I'm just um, But make sure that Father's Day is special. This is um, actually my first Father's Day without my father. Um, my father transitioned in July last year. And so, you know, while for, for some, these types of holidays um, actually bring joy or sadness or to, to many, and, and again, to the Reed family, um, you know, his children, his wife, his, his family, this is going to be especially 
um, are we hampering them? So let's keep them lifted in prayer. But happy Father's Day to all. And look, let's continue to make East Point the best city in the world. And so the whole world will know that um, people from all around will gather with us and say, let's get to the point that there's no point like East Point. And I promise you, there's all other places to be. So good night. Have a great evening. Stay blessed. Stay well, stay healthy, stay safe. Follow the guidelines. We're all vaccinated. That's why you see um, us here tonight. I encourage you to back up as well. Um, and look, let's continue to get through this together. Thank you so much, East Point. Have a great evening.